I'd now like to introduce someone on stage who has had a heart, someone else's heart, for 22 years, if I'm not mistaken. Kelly Perkins, an American heart transplant recipient known for climbing mountains, and she does it to partly inspire others and promote organ donation. She has set world records as the first ever heart transplant recipient to scale the most famous mountains in the world. Perkins has selected peaks of many famous mountains with both personal and cause-related significance since her heart transplant back in 1995. And a good example is a climb of El Capitan in Yosemite Park with its natural heart-shaped cutout where she was recently quoted as saying, We thought how great would that be to climb straight through the heart of El Capitan. In a symbolic way, we're tugging on the heartstrings of people to be educated about organ donation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kelly Perkins. It was 2005, in the middle of the night, and I, my bladder was ready to burst. Now, many of us in this room have had to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, right? Well, what's different is this. Now, picture this. I am dangling from a rope the size of my forefinger 2,000 feet above just vacant space. That's 600 meters. So I'm looking back. Um, here is a photo of me and my, who became my future husband. Um, I grew up in the mountains in Lake Tahoe in California. And one of our very first dates, I invited him to go for a hike. Now normally in the summer you go for a hike, you've got your boots, you've got a backpack on. I said, wouldn't it be fun to bring a pair of skis? Just in, in the event that we find a little patch of snow, we could make our little mark and make it an adventure. You know, adventure is what made me feel alive. Fast forward our five-year wedding anniversary. We had gone to Europe, and we just had a small backpack on our back and just no reservations. We were free. The world was ours. This is the way we were living at the time. And the reason why I have this particular photo here is because this is the last photo of me being 100% healthy. When we came home from this particular trip, I had been a runner at the time, always athletic, and I knew my resting heart rate was 50 beats per minute, but my heart felt different. And of course, you don't notice your heart unless something's kind of going on. So I went to the doctor, he took a look at me, and I'm, again, the picture of health. I think I was even in a running outfit. And he did an EKG, and it was four times my normal heart rate. And I was sitting on the examination table. So obviously, we knew something was wrong. But here I am, this healthy person, 30 years old, no history of any kind of heart disease, and I was honestly thinking I would get a pill, he would send me home with it, and in a week I'd be out running again, right? Well, it didn't turn out quite that way. So I was diagnosed with viral cardiomyopathy. And so what this virus did was it attacked the surface of my heart, which caused interruptions in the electrical cycle, which caused me to go into really fast arrhythmias. So this was very life-threatening. In fact, during this three-year period, I spent weeks at a time in the hospital. I had all kinds of implants, not, not these, <laughs> obviously. But again, looking back at you know, progress, back in the day, my first defibrillator was the size of an old Walkman, like the size of a book. And it was down here, and I had wires threading through my heart. And I couldn't have two experimental devices in my body at once. I mean, I was just kind of a bit of a guinea pig. But it was also what was keeping me alive. I was on medications that weren't even named yet, or they weren't, my, they weren't indicated for hearts. But we were doing whatever we could to keep me going. My only savior was a heart transplant. And that was three years later in 1995. Now, when that happened, of course, it's a new beginning. And my first thing I wanted to do was distance myself from 
from the medical. As much as I love my doctors and they were my teammates, everything else, I had to get back to where I thrive. And that was going back to the mountains. And so I started training. You know, I put on a heavy backpack and I spent days, hours, just always, always exercising to make sure I could get stronger and, and get back to the life that I knew and that I loved. And one of the things I wanted to do, one of my big goals was to go to Yosemite Valley, California. This is a national park, world renowned, and there is this particular peak called Half Dome. And I was drawn to this particular peak because as you look at it, you can see that it's broken, but it still stands tall. And that's kind of how I felt. It just resonated with me. I wanted to, I wanted to feel, even though I'm not 100%, I could still stand tall. So we took on this, this hike. My husband's a great supporter. It's like, OK, let's just get as fast as we can go. If I'm not feeling good, we'll turn around and come back. No big deal. Well, we, we actually made it. We made it all the way to the summit. And here's a picture. It, again, this is a ledge, and then it looks to, off to the sheer cliff. And we got on our bellies and went over, and we peeked over the edge, and we saw these little white helmets coming up. And they, they looked like little ants climbing up the wall. And I thought, oh my god, that is the coolest thing ever, right? But here we are, still at the halfway point, and I was just happy to be there after all I had been through just to be on top of a mountain after just all this medical madness that was going on, it was great to be there. What happened was on the way back down, I got dehydrated and I ended up in the hospital. And it wasn't because I was reckless and didn't remember to bring water, it's because my medications actually caused me to be a little bit more dehydrated going into that. And I didn't really know to measure that or not. But I learned a lot from this. I was also, it was very disappointing, as you can imagine. I did this as a comeback. And it absolutely backfired on me. Friends and family were saying, you're a bit reckless, aren't you, going up you know, into the mountains? And you, know, you just got this beautiful new heart. And what are you doing? And as much as I heard them, I couldn't. I knew it, I was more than that. And, you know, we all make mistakes, and that's how progress that's, leads you in the different direction or whatever, but you move on. But you recognize and you learn from it. So my only way to really come back was to pick a bigger mountain. So this particular mountain is also in California. And what's, what was... The reason why I wanted to go back to this mountain is because I had actually done this with my native heart. So this would be a direct comparison of my donor heart versus my, my birth heart. And so this was, it's a pretty demanding hike for anybody. And he's my oxygen secret here. <laughs> That's my husband, of course. But I really felt if I could get here, you know, that I'd really be back. And I did, I got to the summit, and it was a great, great feat for me personally. I was the only one to really do it, one mountain with two separate hearts, which was great. But let me just say, and forgive me if all of you know this, but the difference with a heart transplant and a native heart is your nerves are severed, so my brain doesn't communicate with my heart. So it's very different, it took me longer, it was harder, um, I had to pay attention to a lot more. So it wasn't just like, you know, it's different than getting a kidney or a liver, and I'm not diluting that at all, but it was very different. It's my engine, so it works differently. Well, after this, I really wanted to go on and do something really remarkable and big. We got a lot of um, inspirational um, feedback from doing Mount Whitney, and so I thought, let's do something big. And this was right around the millennium. I wanted to celebrate milestones, and I thought, how cool would that be to come to Africa, the continent where the very first heart transplant took place, and to climb their tallest peak? And so we did. We came over here. We chose, many of you know, there's many routes going to the top. 
we chose the longest one to ensure we would have success. And, you know, you're spending days on the mountain. And there's so much to look, look at. And there's all these different climate zones. It's, it's gorgeous. It's a wonderful climb. At the same time, I had to pay attention to my heart rate, my O2 levels, my blood pressure, none of which were predictable at all. And again, nobody had really done this before, so I really had to pay attention to a lot. Well, this is actually, this looks like a big red pill. What it actually is, is it mimics a lower elevation. So in the event that I had a problem, we had backups. The final day was horrible. <laughs> it was the coldest I've ever been in my life. Fierce winds, but I could see the summit was there and I was very, very excited. Get to the top, look for my husband and he's on the ground. He had altitude sickness. So unfortunately he had to go down. It broke my heart, but he encouraged me to go on because the bigger picture was me getting the summit. And I did, which was a wonderful, wonderful feat. So here I am standing at you know, the top, the roof of Africa. And I, um, I'm, I'm thinking about all those people that came before me and laid the groundwork for me to be standing here. Again, we just heard the very first recipient lived 18 days. And this is six years after my transplant when my life expectancy was 10 years at that time. So after this, we went down, we celebrated, went to the Grutscher Hospital. We also went to the museum. Talk about daunting, the very first, they have all that old equipment where the very first heart transplant took place. That is scary. But this all kind of laid the groundwork. We're here, we actually went a fit, um, table mount. Dr. Barnard had died just a month before we came over and we were expecting to meet him. So instead we met with his daughter up on table mount, which was kind of a nice full circle. But after this, this laid the foundation for me to go on and do, you know, further explore my capabilities. And this is when I got more excited about the technical climbing. So I started training, and I, training in a gym, went outside, tried all different, you know, different mountains, and just to get as much experience as, as I could, because I had to go back to what I mentioned before. When I saw those little white helmets coming up that peak, I had my mind on that. So this is a route that we chose the second time. So we actually climbed up the face of this. And again, it was, there's a little bit of that, a little bit of fear made me feel really alive, but there was also the message of being broken but standing tall and coming back. And this was your classic granite wall climb. We spent two days on this and it is sheer. And so there's a lot you're paying attention to. You've got gear, you've got ropes. You're, you're looking at the path, the direction you're going. But I also have to always take care of my heart, right? So there's, it's always a, just a tad more complicated traveling in this type of world like this. But here I am, I'm smiling. I, I love this because I can relax and smile in this situation because I trust the system. I trust my ropes, I trust my team. And if we think about this in the medical environment, it's such a, it, no one does anything on their own. It's such teamwork. And every, every person who participates is part of any one person's success. And what was fun about this is when I got to the very rim, I looked out over the top and I saw the sea of red. And this is, a, this is an international destination where people come from all over the world to climb this peak. And we actually had some friends that were helping us out. And anybody who came up, actually a lot of people had heard that there was this heart recipient climbing the face. And so they were coming up, they were kind of excited to see what does that look like, right? And <laughs> I know. And so when I got up, I saw this just sea of red and all these people had hung out and they were waiting to see me come up over the cliff, which is really neat. So we're all, you know, we're all celebrating, all excited. And this is a picture we had a friend fly over. If you can see, there's a picture of all these people are humans supporting our, our the, the climb that I did, supporting our organ donation. And this is the result here. 
So again, none of this would happen without these pioneers, Dr. Barnard, Denise Darvo, Louis Wisconski, and you know, I just hope that I too will just give inspiration to others, you know, down the road to explore their capabilities. So thank you all.